Singapore doesn't really have a football culture as such. It has a football betting culture. Singapore football has been rooted in the past for, for a long, long time. What we aim to do is to raise the level of Singapore football across all levels. And that means having a better ecosystem. I've never seen like football fans as crazy as the Singapore football fans, to be honest. You know, I played for five clubs, I uh, won eight titles uh, for Singapore Cup. I was three times player of the year, three times top scorer. I scored 387 goals. Future of Singapore football, I, I hope, I hope, I really hope that uh, there's progress. There used to be a vibrant football culture in the 1960s and 70s, in the time of the Malaysia Cup, when there was a real international, kind of almost domestic rivalry, causeway rivalry between Singapore and Malaysia that went back the best part of a century. The Malaysia Cup was set up in the 1920s. So you had this 70-ish year history between Singapore and Malaysia, a real Liverpool, Man U, Celtic Rangers, Barca, Real Madrid, kind of rivalry that was intense and visceral and real and guttural and you could feel it. I arrived in Singapore in 1996. The Malaysia Cup ended in 1994 because of too much match fixing. I mean Singapore's participation in the Malaysia Cup ended in 1994 and they set up their own league in 1996 hoping that you would get this hangover and initially yes but several things happened. The first thing was they realized very quickly, you can't cultivate a rivalry overnight. It has to be established over years and decades and go from generation to generation. You can't create a Liverpool Everton type rivalry overnight. Well, it's, it's kind of, it's been a kind of a, a rise and fall and rise again, uh, really, because Singapore football, um, has been rooted in the past for, for a long, long time. And, and, and in the past, that is because in terms of the actual socio-political um, background with the whole part of being part of, 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 of the, the Malaya Confederation, then there was always this business about Singapore basically operating as a kind of a rival state to the, the Malaysian states. So, you know, you, you'll have heard, I'm sure, from many people you've spoken to for this about the uh, uh, Malaysia Cup. And of course, the Malaysia Cup days were heralded, um, you know, through this very sort of nostalgic vision as being the greatest era for Singapore football. And sure, back then, you know, Singapore would be competing with Selangor or whoever it may be. And then there was the glory era, you know, through the 80s into the early 90s when they were winning the Malaysia Cup, when Fadi Ahmad and all the local legends were born. And the old national stadium gave birth to the Kalang Roar. And, and of course, there was this lovely sort of... Um, you know, from uh, era when people used to go to the football in their tens of thousands and, and watch Singapore do well. But what's interesting is that having seen sort of when they when they when they set up the, the S League um, back in, in the mid '90s, um, and it started off very well heralded. It, it obviously sort of has declined a bit over the years to the point that now they've rejuvenated things and they're, they're galvanizing things with the privatization, with the Unleash the Raw project. You feel that now Singapore has actually got into a position where it no longer has to be subordinate to Malaysia, as it were. It no longer has to be framed as you know, part of that Malaysian competitive context. And I think this is hugely important. Hi, I'm Eddie. I'm 34 and I support the Lion City Sailors. Privatisation, we've already seen the impact of this, and not just in terms of the influx of quality players um, like Lopez or Lestien into the league. 
but also because we've seen Lion City Sailors develop an elite academy, which is really sensational. Uh, building facilities, which are gonna just drag things up to the next level. But also, if you look at the quality of the digital marketing that they bring to the game, the social media, the whole wraparound experience, the professionalism levels that they are now uh, developing and attaining, will rub off on the rest of the league, which means that Singapore football as a whole will be dragged, as can only really happen in Singapore. You know, this is a country that went from no Formula One to the world's first ever street circuit night race in about 10 months. So this is a can-do country. And, and, and with this in, in place, I think we're going to see very rapid growth. I think uh, it's a model to, for, for, in my opinion, it's a model to follow. Um, uh, huge investment into the, into the playing, uh, playing roster, into the, office, uh, into the staff, you know, to get uh, good quality, high caliber. Uh, coaches in, you know, I think will, will definitely uh, aid the, the players uh, and the development of the club on and off the field as well. Uh, I think we have good examples in the region, you know, a few other clubs who are doing well and have qualified for, for the next stage of the AFC Champions League as well. So, so I think for Singapore football, yeah, I think the Lion City Sailors are, are showing the way forward and uh, for, for me, yeah, in my opinion, for in the near, near future, it's the, it's the way, good, way to go. Yeah. Lion City Sailors was obviously rebranded from Home United. So Home United was a club that I followed for thank you. Decades, okay, <laughs> for decades and um, basically when they rebranded, they became Lion City Sailors, so it means a lot to me because I've followed it for years and years, but uh, I think it also heralds the dawn of a new era for Singapore football with the investment that they've put in, so, you know, I, I hope not only that Lion City Sailors does well for Lion City Sailors, but also for Singapore football, yeah. Purely by bad luck, at the same time as they started their domestic league in the late 90s, two things happened. Cable television exploded and the internet, early dial-up internet, took off. Which meant what? For the first time ever, Singaporeans were exposed to English Premier League and other leagues, but particularly English Premier League, live on a weekly basis like never before. So just as you're hoping for your domestic league to go up, you've got this EPL rocket going to the moon. And so as a consequence, you know, domestic football plateaued just as EPL skyrocketed. And it, was, it wasn't apples and oranges, it was apples against an entire fruit orchard. There's no way that domestic football in its infancy, small domestic Singaporean football can possibly compete with this EPL juggernaut. So it just crushed this nascent domestic league almost it was almost stillborn I think I think when, when I first started uh, reporting um, uh, in 2000 2003 and then the S League uh, the, 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 the the head of the S League was trying all every ways to see how they can incorporate uh, balance, you know, people watching Premier League and people watching Singapore Premier League. The the passion of, of, of people supporting the Premier League teams here, um, sometimes they, they, they just ignore the what was what what is on the plate in the Singapore Premier League. Um, but obviously, there are people who, who like who, who, who can support afford the time to support both leagues, but. Is rare, um, and obviously, Premier League being so successful, and then the teams are being so good, keep winning. Um, it, it, it obviously, it's a much more uh, pleasing to support uh, the likes of Liverpool or, or even Manchester United during during the, the last decade. So, 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 so it, it is, it is a problem. For people who don't know, Singapore is like, a, you have a two million, um, well, five million people, uh, two and a half million people is uh, for Liverpool, two and a half million people is uh, Manchester United because of history, because they, in 60s or 70s, they used to listen on the radio and people follow those teams like a crazy, like, a, that's like the biggest, I think biggest fans outside of, uh, I think England is actually here in Asia. Uh, I can say that. Right, hi guys, I'm Kavin from uh, East of Matthew, Singapore. 
So we're just taking a walk around our old stomping ground, Kitty Hall area, to a place called Chimes, where all the boys who used to come, they'll remember the place, Harry's Bar and Chimes. It's no more there, but Chimes is still there, so let's go take a look. This whole stretch used to be Harry's Bar, and uh, all the boys would all be here, all in red. So like even uh, in like, say, uh, a game against Man United or something, the United fans, they don't walk by here, they are all parked over there. So they know that if they come here, some kind of trouble will spark. We start singing songs like, if I had the wings of a sparrow, those kind of things. So, they'll get quick. Yeah. We used to hang out here all the time. Then recently we watched the Champions League final against Spurs over here. This will be called Berlin Bar, I don't think so, it's still around. So this is where you this is where it kind of started off for us. Yeah, this is like one of the most iconic shops in Singapore, it's called La Bajita. It's been here like since I was a teenager, probably now what, 26 years or more. Yeah, so it's like they have all kind of collectibles. I came here when I was like probably in my teens, 13. Like even my dad used to bring me here to buy stuff when he was around. La Bajita. You can see the, the passion because in Singapore, for example, the top seven or eight English football clubs have their own supporters club in Singapore. They are registered here officially with the Registry of Societies, which governs non-for-profit football clubs like us. And you know, live gatherings are shown, events uh, are held, and you know, people gather to watch football primarily. Those who can, are fortunate to be able to afford it. They travel to the UK to watch games and you know, if some of the English clubs make it to major uh, European football finals. You know, uh, they travel to those regions as well. The Chelsea Football Club, uh, for example, we participated in the Europa League final in Baku. And, you know, many fans from Singapore went to attend the game and, you know, it wasn't easy getting there, for example. Uh, there's no direct flights, you had to intercross from, from different countries. But there comes the passion, where people made the game and thankfully we won that final. The football culture here is a very interesting culture in that it's very easy for people to say, well, it's, a, it's an audience in which they only watch overseas football. And, and I think people, particularly doing what I do for a living, they tend to paint it in very black and white terms. Oh, we well, see, you're part of the problem. You know, you're that colonizing force that is the Premier League. And if it wasn't for you, people would develop football organically here. Well, I think that's rather simplistic and I think there's an agenda attached to that. Because the Premier League and Singapore's professional football operate on such different scales in terms of the magnitude of the league, the um, size of the, of, the, of the clubs involved, the size of the audience. I, I think it's again overly simplistic to say that one really detracts from the other. When you talk about the Premier League and football in Asia, in Singapore, you have to talk about gambling. Honestly, out there, the betting culture was crazy. It's like nothing I've seen before. I'm convinced that if there were two cockroaches racing from one end of the room to another, that they'd have a bet on it. But I saw it all at first hand. I presented a show called Football Face Off in um, 2012, 2013. So I was the presenter and I had a special guest every week. Now you're not allowed to promote betting on television in Singapore but we kind of pushed the envelope as far as we could with this football face-off show, because it was essentially, we were predicting the outcome of the Premier League matches that were taking place the following day. We recorded it live on the Friday night, and I would make my predictions. We, was go, we would go as far as, I think there's gonna be two goals or less scored, or three goals or more scored. So you could look at the form guide, you could look at the two teams, you could look at players who were unavailable and make a bit of a judgment call. You could say who is gonna win that game or if it's gonna be a draw or a score draw. So we were essentially giving lots of betting tips 
but without officially giving betting tips. But obviously, a lot of people would tune into that show because they wanted some insights, because there was this betting obsession. And so I remember being at a taxi rank after we'd done a few shows, and I think I must have had a decent run of form, which a lot of it is pure luck, isn't it? And uh, a taxi driver made me get into his cab and he said, Richard, you know, Richard, I have lost everything. I have lost my wife, I have lost my family, I have lost my home, I have lost £100,000 in, in life savings all through gambling. And he was giving me this story and I just wondered where it was going. I thought it was going to be a story of inspiration, how he turned things around. But he just then said to me, but I need you, Richard, to help me win it all back. I want to take your phone number. I want to be able to call you every Saturday and you predict the results for me, lah. And that just kind of typified things for me, how betting can kind of spiral out of control because it's such an obsession. Well, the betting culture and the football culture, I would say, are like, you know, <laughs> um, next to each other, right? They write it to, next to each other. And it's very, very difficult to, I would say, not talk about it, especially as a football fan or even someone working in football because I see it a lot in the culture here. You know, people come to games just to bet, actually, to be honest, because you can honestly make a lot of money. I think it can be quite toxic, to be honest, if you're just going to look at football as a means of making money and betting. Because personally, I've seen for myself some of my friends that I've, you know, worked with as well who are very into the betting scene, and, and it does affect the mentality and, and the growth and the health of the sport. Um, I would say Singapore doesn't really have a football culture as such, it has a football betting culture which is a little controversial, but in my 20 odd years of being in Singapore, they have this mentality where they like to have an interest. Um, people don't just want to watch the game necessarily for its own sake. They want to have an interest, an edge, a reason beyond the sport itself to watch it. So they invariably gamble as well. So for example, per head of population, Singapore has the highest rate of sports gambling in the world second only to Australia. Um, so football culture, not quite. Football betting culture, most definitely. I think it, it should just be taken as a sport itself and not linked to betting because that's how you can really enjoy the game. If you're going to watch a football game, don't just look at it as a way to make money because that just ruins the way, you know, ruins your whole experience of the game. And, and, I, and I'm absolutely against it, to be honest, but I see why people want to try and make money out of it because it can be quite lucrative in that sense but I think there has to be a limit you know and perhaps I will be I'll be really happy if they stop you know uh, they actually made uh, betting illegal in, in the Singapore Premier League to be honest uh, but it's going to make a lot of people unhappy but for me I think it helps the sport So the betting culture became a real problem for me at work one pretty fateful uh, Saturday. So 2013-2014 season, I presented a show that I'm not just saying, it was ahead of its time. It was like Soccer Saturday that you get in the UK that Jeff Stelling presents. But as well as bringing updates about the scores, we were able to show the Premier League goals just like that. So for this particular show, I desperately needed my producer to be bang at it. He needed to be able to give me up-to-date information all the time because I'm presenting a three-hour live show with no advert breaks, with two guests, including Paul Parker, the ex- Manchester United international and Neil Humphreys, who uh, is an author, comedian, very, very funny and, you know, very knowledgeable man when it comes to football. So you need the information in real time so that you can relay it to the viewers. Now, unfortunately, my producer was a gambling addict and he used to bet big, big money on odds on certainties. So on this particular Saturday, towards the end of the football season, he put $50,000 or the, no, it was £50,000, the equivalent of, on Manchester United to beat Cardiff. Now with five minutes to go, Manchester United were losing against Cardiff. I've not heard anything from my producer for five, 10 minutes, and there must have been things happening. So I'm having to just somehow keep this train on the rails without any information coming from the cockpit at all. And after the show finished, I found out about this. And for that whole period of time, he's just standing in the control room, banging his head against the wall. I think luckily for him, I think Manchester United nicked a couple of goals at the end and he managed to save his money, but that is how pervading, all pervading the betting culture is, now it can affect things. Thankfully, we turn to some lighter news, crippling gambling addiction in Singapore. 
I think when it comes to raising the standards in Singapore, there are lots of issues that all kind of combine. I think the gambling issue is certainly a factor. You have a problem with middle-class parents in Singapore who don't see sport, professional sport, as a career option. A lot of people want their children to go and work in the city. They want them to be marketeers and, and all the rest of it. They don't necessarily see a pathway into becoming professional athletes. Traditionally, academics have come first and second and third and fourth and fifth in Singapore. And football has been left behind. I think it's all in the money. It's all in the, the, the dollars and cents. And, you know, we, we talk about in the past and, and from where or from how I grew up, uh, the money wasn't great, you know, playing football full time. And then you have, uh, and in Singapore, it's, it's a big thing. Academically, it's, it's a big, big thing. You know, you, you got to study, study, and study. It's all about certs and certificates and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, growing up, uh, it wasn't really viable, you know, and, and you, you got to be the top, top player to get there and, and be getting, what, your, your, your 10Ks a month or 15Ks a month. So that, that's a problem. Okay, I'll be blunt. We are a 70% Chinese majority nation and our majority race does not want to play the game. And every time I go into meetings with the Football Association of Singapore or other stakeholders, and they say, Neil, we need to come up with ideas to get people to play the game. Get the Chinese to play. I can't say that, that's too sensitive. Then the conversation's over. No self-respecting parent in this tiger mum culture is gonna say, my kid can be a professional footballer. He doesn't have anywhere to play. We don't have any space. So just play the odds. The law of averages suggests that chances of him being funneled, finding a pathway to become a professional footballer are negligible. So go be an accountant, go be a doctor, go be an engineer, all wonderful careers by the way. Do not, under any circumstances, become a footballer. The, the, the biggest thing is to let them know that there's life, there's a career after football. Because the idea is still that, you know, once you finish your playing career at about 30, 35, what next? When, 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 when parents look at um, the situation, um, they're thinking that, you know, why, why should I, uh, I mean, why should I put my <laughs> uh, kid through all the uncertainties? So, so it, it, is, it is a problem. Parents aspire their children to be professionals, such as doctors, bankers, lawyers. Football or sports as a whole, is down the packing order. In my opinion, if we could do something to change this, would be to encourage uh, more children to take up sports and football in particular when they are younger and to cultivate a culture that enjoys football as a long-term uh, career for themselves. And then the other obvious factor is and this is obviously a complex and controversial issue, is national service. Now, if you're taking young people away from the age of 16 to 18, I'm sorry, but that does not, it means that you simply cannot equate that with being a professional athlete, certainly a professional footballer, because those two years, developmental years, 16 to 18, are arguably the most important as you try and transition from youth football into men's football. There are really, really top talented boys that can come out and find ways that they could provide service to the country. Um, and it's just an opinion whereby it's not necessary um, serving uniform groups, but they could also serve the country in different ways. Um, but then it's, uh, and then at some stage you might be opening a can of worms, right? And then you've got floodgates of um, applicants saying that, oh, I could do this, I could do this. And then it sort of gives national service um, uh, the positioning of national service um, um, in a very bad light, whereby there's, there's no sense of pride in serving your country. It's a, it's a very, um, it's, it's volatile. It's a very, it's, 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 it's a question whereby um, it has to be uh, looked, it looked at on a case by case basis. And if you have a talented boy at some stage, whereby he could bring dreams uh, to the country, and that's something obviously we can look at it um, when that position arrives. I think we've all seen the national service issue kind of raise its head again. You know, over the last year or so, we've seen young Harry Burtwistle try and renounce his Singaporean citizenship 
in order to join Wolves. I mean, what an opportunity for the young lad to become a Premier League footballer, but obviously you've still got this national service issue looming large. The same thing happened to, to Ben Davis, who managed to get a contract at Fulham. He's now doing very well um, at Oxford. So this is the problem, isn't it? You know, the, the two just don't go together. If you want a culture of encouraging professional sports people in Singapore, and national service is an enormous stumbling block. So Singapore have essentially lost a couple of flagship players. You never know, they could have added real substance to the national team if they'd have made themselves available. And eventually it does some burn whistle. And it's all because those lads chose attempting to become professional footballers over national service, something that would in all likelihood have killed their footballing aspirations in a heartbeat. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'll be looking forward for you to come back and play for Singapore. It's an honor, Fandi. Singapore, let's take a shot. Give us a chance to dream. Jude Bellingham, greetings from Borussia Dortmund. I'd like to wish you and everyone in Singapore all the very best in your sporting success and I hope we are able to come to Singapore sometime soon to share our BVB philosophy and develop the talented youth in Singapore. Take care and stay safe. Yeah, we've, we've signed the, uh, an, an MOU with them and primarily focusing on uh, development of the players as well as youth uh, and coaches. Um, one of which is, is for us to, to mentor. Um, and I think, look, I think at the end of the day for us as Bruce Don, we're not here to come in and say, look, you know, you need to do this and this and this. I think for us, we have our own um, way of, of, of providing um, a successful uh, model of, for training, be it for the youth, be it for, for, for coaches. Um, and then uh, what they would eventually need to do is tweak it and make it a Singapore style. We provide um, the basis, we provide the ammunition, we provide the facility, sort of the, the know-hows and then they cultivate it through our guidance, a Singapore way of, of a, me a methodology for coaching or methodology for, for youth. Um, and that's something that we are hoping that we could, we could kick off uh, hopefully this year. Um, and uh, it has been, uh, it's, it's been a, a really, really good foresight from the government in terms of what they would like to, to achieve for professional football as far as Singapore is concerned if you were to look into um, many of the playgrounds or even in the pictures you could see young players wanting to go out there and live their dreams um, and having the, the uh, Unleash the Raw project gives you that opportunity to live your dreams and we are happy to be part of that and to guide them and to at least um, coordinate and support them to, to achieve the goals that's been set out by this Unleash the Rural project, which is, uh, uh, just came came actually during the COVID time, and, uh, and uh, we we are now really targeting the schools, uh, schools, better schools to take or take uh, ownership ownership for their football teams, and uh, you know bringing the football in the schools. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also playing the part for the you know younger younger kids also to. There's a lot of schools in Singapore who don't have us uh, football in the in the in, in in the schools, so we are trying to. Bring those schools with no football also to, to to have a kids to play kick the ball and play football and um, this is the uh, project huge project for the uh, basically we we hoping that uh, you know we can do in next um, well uh, 2034 is a kind of our goal to see where we could be in uh, you know so it's um, it's just uh, just kind of unleashed uh, this uh, unleashed the road the project so it's. Uh, we just got these 10 schools, we're we bringing the, some overseas coaches also to be 
here around us and uh, you know to, together with the local coaches so we can share some um, uh, good uh, experience from overseas and uh, you know so also to uh, our coaches also to learn from those experienced coaches from overseas and uh, for the kids also it's benefits uh, because they are getting the best coaches and best coaching uh, philosophy uh, and hopefully really I think this is this is the something this project is really can really give us um, uh, some really big boost in, uh, in, in future. I know the Unleash the Raw project is a good idea with good incentives whether it will cut through to use PR cliche whether it will cut through and resonate with the public I'm cynical. Look, I was around when we had the Goal 2010 project, which was Singapore launched the Goal 2010 project in the year 2000, and Singapore was going to qualify for the World Cup by 2010. And when Singaporeans had stopped laughing, they said, never going to happen. Oh, it's going to... We knew at the time it wasn't going to happen, but we had to get on board, you know. Yes, we can do it. We can go from 0 to 60 in eight, nine years. We didn't even get past the first stage of Asian qualifying for the World Cup. For, for a nation like Singapore to get anywhere near the World Cup, first they have to be a dominant force in Southeast Asian football, then they have to bridge the gap from Southeast Asia to the rest of Asia, particularly the best West Asian sides, Japan, Korea and so forth. It takes a lot of doing. And then the Asian nation has to then make more of an impact at the World Cup and we haven't really seen that too significantly in the history of the World Cup so far. So, so let's take that with a pinch of salt and let's just understand that for what it is. We can't get past the bottom. We can't get on the bottom rung of the ladder. Look, it's a great idea, great initiative. The, the key development is grassroots. Get kids playing in the schools past secondary school age. Look, the history of, of football, and, and this is a global thing, has seen, for whatever reason, political reasons, um, personal branding reasons. People have made grand predictions down the year. Look at Pele, for example. Pele said that, that, that an African nation would win the World Cup by the year 2000. And we've got to a point now where I don't think they've got beyond the quarterfinals, right? So, so you know, pe people have, for whatever reason, always... I, I used to go regularly to um, Asian Football Confederation events. In fact, I used to host them quite often. And back in the day, uh, Seth Blatter would get on stage and he would always say, the future is Asia. Just as maybe in the next week he would be in Africa saying the future is Africa. So when somebody says we're going to qualify for the World Cup, I, I, maybe, that, maybe that is done for political reasons, maybe that is done to, to get some kind of uh, headline or maybe even to get some kind of governmental support. The reality is that with Unleash the Raw, yes a lot of the headlines will be grabbed by people saying oh you said you're going to do this in 2034 or you're going to do this. Ignore that. For me, the substance is in the actual methodology of the plan, which is to create an infrastructure, to create a vibrant grassroots, to improve the quality of the league, to develop pathways. This is the key to unleash the raw. I watched the local league for, for five years and I must say that uh, we really have improved our fan culture. Uh, last time, I must admit, it wasn't so great, I wasn't too impressed about it, but, it, but the league got more competitive, the fans got the, 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 the fan support from the stands got more intense because uh, you can see the players fighting for every ball nowadays and of course it's raised the centre of local football here as well, uh, which and I think uh, this is the right direction that we're heading in. And as what Joseph said, we are starting, with, uh, we, we are trying to, to uh, start a whole new culture you know with our with, with our club and of course uh, get more fans to come down for the for, for local matches like I, like I mentioned just now so uh, I, I really look forward to the next few games maybe more fans will come maybe in the coming years as well I'm really excited for the future of local football actually for us as LCS fans uh, as founders of the crew we hope that we can start with our club to bring Singapore football to greater heights yes
thank you guys for coming down to a, a local football game because uh, you know we really need the support for local football nowadays and I, and I hope that uh, Singaporeans watching this will come down to a game. I'm sure you guys will really enjoy it.